Let's start with a little thing. The numbers are off because I did this four years ago, but the concept is, is, concept is true. This is my foundation, to the government. I don't get paid, I'm a missionary, I'm a volunteer, I travel around giving a speech. Now, when you get my card, my, my uh, book, my cards in there, I want you to take it. Truth in Government, look at the speeches I've given over the last 30 years, <coughs> the audits I've written, all of that much stuff. Okay? I have smart interns working with me. And uh, I want you to get this message embedded that there's something that has to be done. And you could be part of that solution. You're going to jump into the pool. This is your money. We're not planning ahead or not. But I spent $15,000 of my friend's money. They gave it, they got a tax deduction, choosing government, on what you're going to see, a whiteboard having the information, two minutes to make the case. Let's solve that. Meet Johnny. Johnny's just a child, but soon he's going to grow up and he'll want to achieve the American dream for himself and his family. But the way elected officials are spending money in Washington, Johnny's future is uncertain. We all know about the $17 trillion national debt, but what's really alarming is the $55 trillion in additional debt that the federal government has incurred in promised obligations. That's over $520,000 that Johnny owes alone. And Johnny's parents are most likely not aware of the costs of these obligations. That's because legally, politicians don't need to tell you about them. See, the basic difference lies in the accounting system Washington uses. Under the federal government's cash basis system of accounting, expenses are recorded at the moment they're paid. Whereas under a better accounting system, the accrual basis, an expense is recognized when a bill is received, even before it's paid. For example, when the government makes promises to senior citizens to pay Social Security, those expenses should be recorded when they're promised, and those promises need to be kept. So what's that mean for Johnny? Well, as a major accounting firm once put it, given the existing practice of cash basis budgeting and reporting, promises can be made without knowledge of their full cost. This creates an incentive for elected officials to curry favor with today's voters at the expense of tomorrow's taxpayers. This allows politicians to make promises without having to disclose how much they're really going to cost. This means that Johnny's future is being put in jeopardy by politicians who make unsustainable promises just to win votes. But so too is the financial health of our country. If you don't believe us, look at an independent study done by Stanford University in 2011. It ranks the most fiscally sustainable countries in the world. While Australia and New Zealand, which use accrual accounting, are ranked number one and number two, the United States is a dismal number 28. That's just ahead of near bankrupt Greece. Is it the problem becoming clearer? The current way the United States government accounts for its bills is making the American future that much more uncertain. It's not a legacy we should leave for Johnny or any of our kids. To learn more, please visit truthandgovernment.org. Try to make it a simple problem that we have an intergenerational problem. You might say it's intergenerational control. We are perpetuating not generation. Why? Because number one, the accounting system is not the right one. If you buy stock, we have a, a, an agency called the Securities and Exchange Commission to protect the shareholders so that their retirement the money doesn't disappear. They need to have independent orders. Every one of those companies on the New York Stock Exchange, American Stock Exchange, any stock exchange, you cannot go and sell stock until you have an independent audit, not government accountants. Price Waterhouse, Deloitte and Touche, whatever they call them today. They used to be eight, now they're down to four. Why? Because we need independent people. We don't want to hear of any conflicts of interest. What you just heard on voting is a conflict of interest. I want to get elected. I'm going to promise you. But to promise you means I got to pay for it. How are we paying for it? Well, let's raise the taxes. How are we raising? I mean, is there enough? No. That's why we have deficit. What's the definition of a deficit? It's the difference between the revenue and what I spend. 
make it very simple. Okay? So we add that deficit, and all we have, there hasn't been a surplus since Lyndon Baines Johnson. You keep, and Clinton said he had a surplus. No, he didn't. He was using the wrong accounting system. The point is, they keep adding those accumulated deficits, they become the debt. And if we don't pay it down, and we keep spending, and we have interest on that debt, I'm going to show you these slides. Now, we have until what, 15 minutes to go? What's the end? Yeah, 10 okay. 50. I, I go through it. Let's, so I want you to see how bold I was. Not only was I bold to run for Congress and win in a district that gave me no chance to win. But when I got to Congress, the reason why I don't have titles and medals and nothing about it, I didn't look for any of that stuff. Because I spoke truth to power. And you'll see it on my website. I want to switch now. You're going to see me in the midst of 600 lobbyists in Simi Valley, California. Ronald Reagan's library. I'm under Air Force One. They have a hanging there. Probably a plastic version of the field to me. <laughs> the point is, here they are, all together, asking for more money for defense. Now, I want a strong defense. You want a strong defense. But when you want more money, you've got to show the people that you spent what we gave you. You have to account for it. There's a lack of accountability from the Defense Department. And John McCain's a friend of mine, he knows it, he loves what I'm saying, he wants more, a stronger defense, but we need to have a defense that's accountable to America. Let's turn to that one. This took a lot. When you see me here, I had to wait and wait and wait. I think there was only two people who were allowed to ask a question. So here you have the top brass of the Defense Department up front, the lobbyists over here, and I'm holding this bike in my head for 15 minutes, and I'm a pretty good speaker. I'm trying to figure out now, I'm getting nervous, what are the key words I got to say to capture this group? And here it is. Thank you very much. I'm former Congressman Jody Aguardi, Westchester County in New York in the 80s, the first certified public accountant practicing CPA ever elected to Congress. I originally introduced the CFO Act in 1986, twice more in 1987. It was passed in 1990. You've got two major problems. Let me talk about briefly the numbers. The budget problem and a public relations problem. Mm. What's the budget problem? The budget this year, round numbers, $3.8 trillion. 65% of it, including the interest we pay out, is mandatory, including, obviously, a program like Medicaid. So 35% is discretionary. Right. Half that budget is the defense. So you got a problem to compete against the others in that 35%. Education, you name it, all kinds of important things. To do that, you gotta make a good case. How do you make a good case, I'll get to the public relations problem, accountability. When the DOD, the requirement for financial statements, the act that I introduced, started in 1994. The Controller General, in his report, the last statement put out says that the armed services, the DOD, will not be able to comply and get an opinion because there are such material weaknesses in the way you account for things and you want more money. So is there a question in there? The question is, why is it taking so long? I mean, it's not rocket science accounting. You got to okay. get the right people Anyone in there to try to figure out why you can't get an okay. audit of the DOD. Secretary James and Dr. Zakhan. Um, I'm going to, rather than try to explain why, I'm going to agree with you. It has taken too long. And I mentioned briefly that this is something we're hard, uh, working hard on in the Air Force. It, we're working hard across the Department of Defense, including Frank, Bob Work above him. I think. Stay tuned very shortly, like within the next year, you're going to see that we're going to have major advances. We're going to get there. Um, I had a grapple with that when I was comptroller. Um, my successor had a grapple with that. Bob Hale, who's here, had a grapple with that. Um, it's not that people are deliberately trying to not get good audits, obviously. But if you want a clean audit, you can't just throw numbers out there. You're not even going to get a qualified audit. And, it, you know, we're talking about a huge enterprise, $600 billion, give or take. Nothing like that anywhere else. Never had audits before till you actually push this act. And it's just taking time. General Pinero, and then we'll take a question well, the, over here. They are making progress. 
but one of the things they're not making progress on, and one of the reasons is they do not know and they do not track the fully burden and life cycle cost of their personnel, active duty, guard and reserve, or defense civilians. Unlike industry, Maryland, West, others, they have to track their long-term pension costs. They can't just take those off the books. As I said, DOD's got a trillion dollar liability for future costs for retiree health care and pensions that aren't on the books, and they're not even on the books when they right now. So they've got to come to grips with the fully burdened and life cycle costs of their people. They've got to start figuring out what they are, and they've got to account for them and track them every year. What are the answers, by the way, is a capital budget? You don't have a capital budget. You throw all your expenditures into the deficit, and people don't understand the difference between what you need now and what you need later. 37 states have a capital budget. The United States of America doesn't, and I dare say the Department of Defense doesn't have one either. Thank you. Because I want to show you these charts that I prepared just for you. And by the way, this is kind of a test for me because these charts have been asked to speak at a national conference, the American Accounting Association, uh, two panels at uh, Baltimore Harbor in August. One is going to be on ethics. I see this now as a moral problem, not just an accounting problem. This is an ethical and moral problem. So I'm going to present it in that light to the public sector section of the uh, on ethics. And then I can speak to the whole group on the accounting issue. Okay, now, uh, look at this chart, all right? What you got here is the national debt in trillions, okay? 20 trillion was last year, 21 trillion at the end of the fiscal year, by the way, for America is September 30th, and we do get a set of books. We, we, we have a set of books, and we do get an accounting. It's the Government Accounting Office, now it's called the Government Accountability Office. Bring all these numbers together. Without my bill, that's why I want to show you my book, 1990. Imagine the nerve I had putting in a bill in 1987 to change the accounting system and calling for CFOs. They had accountants, they had bookkeepers, they had auditors, they had all kinds of Mickey Mouse people uh, with numbers. They didn't have chief financial officers who not only are supposed to understand the numbers, but what they mean today and for the future. Interpret those numbers. So my bill brought to every government agency CFO, but it also mandated the right accounting system, which is called Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. It's called GAAP Accounting or Accrual Accounting. That word accrual means liabilities, in effect. And I felt that that was important. Well, the Department of Defense from 1994 has been unable, and it's one of the biggest agencies we have in government, to give a set of books that can be even audited, let alone an opinion that it is fair and representative of what's going on. So that's why I had to make that point. 1994, to when I gave that speech a couple of years ago. All right, but look at this. So there, there it is. Now, these numbers are not Joe Giobardi's numbers. This is the Congressional Budget Office, an independent agency, apart from the government. It's funded by the government, but this is not the Budget Committee which is subject to politics. This is an independent. They just came out with their interpretation of the results of operations for the last fiscal year. What was that? September 30th, 19, uh, excuse me, 2017. Okay. So now we got the 10-year projection for the 2028. Now, 33 trillion. That's still the Mickey Mouse method of accounting. Remember that, what you saw with Johnny, 55, 60? You've got to add 60 trillion to that to get the debt that somehow has to be paid if we don't start trimming back entitlements like Social Security. Now, do I want to take away your Social Security? No. And would I change it right now after you plan to retire? No. But somehow, people entering the work workforce, they have to start using common sense. People are living to 70, 80, and 90, and they're still using it's up to 66 and a half. It was always 65. What does that mean? That means that a lot of people are going to look for Social Security that we can't afford, especially the baby boomers, the people born after World War II, and they're coming down the pike right now. This is a big thing, and politics doesn't want to deal with it because they're afraid that the biggest voters are older people, and as soon as they hear someone's going to change Social Security, they don't want to hear anything else. Oh, you're taking away my Social Security. So it becomes a weapon for one of the parties against another party to say, we don't change anything. Now, if we don't change anything, you are screwed. Because I'm going to show you a punch card. 
Now, by the way, the green happens to be the gross domestic product of the United States of America. What is that? That's the sum total, economically, of all goods and services. Look how it is being surpassed by the debt. So 33 trillion on the Mickey Mouse basis, but still it's passing 29 trillion dollars in, in, in gross domestic product, right? That's the green. Go to the pie chart. Oh, great. Now, this is the pie chart that I prepared to show you in 2017, because we know what the actual numbers are, okay? Look at the blue. What's blue? Mandatory spending. What's mandatory? Social Security, Medicare, federal pensions. You can't, unless you have a law in Congress to change that, that's it. Nobody wants to change it. So as a result, look at what the orange is. That's all that Congress deals with today. That 30%. It's called discretionary spending. Non-defense. What, what is it? Education, transportation, agriculture. Better is better. Science, space, tech, uh, homeland security. That's half. What's the other half? Defense. So half of the 30% is defense. Very important. But look at interest on the national debt. $263 billion. And it's 7%. That's not 7% interest getting paid on the Treasury bill, which is the debt we're talking about. The bills that are sold to the American public and to China, right? That's 7% of the 3.9 round numbers, $4 trillion. Multiply it. 7%, then you got the 263. Go to the next part, chart. Now, hold on to your seats. This is America 10 years from now. See, no one has the nerve to do this. I got to do this. And, and I'm going to bring this out nationally to shock America at the reality. Look, you see the blue change? Not much. Why? Because there's been no attempt at entitlement reform. You got to do something. People are living to, what's the average? I think now the average would be 75. And we know that we're paying out at 66 and a half. It used to be 65, they reformed at one point. Now, any change in that reforms that big liability of 60 trillion, because you're talking about a 75 year window to figure out what do we owe the retired people over the next 75 years. So that would then loosen up this pie chart. But look at interest. With the 13 percent, 915 billion. You might say to yourself, "How did we go from 260 billion to 915? What's at work here? Deficits every year, and now we're going back to trillion-dollar deficits annually. If you look at the difference, you'll see that. You go back, yeah, and you'll see that as I show you the next chart that we're going to have years now where we're going to be short every year a trillion dollars." What happens to it? It gets added to the debt. But guess what else is happening? The interest rates are going up. We had a free ride here. The Federal Reserve, in order to keep the economy going, had quantitative easing. They reduced the interest rates practically to zero for bank borrowing. And for the prime rate, I think it was like 2 or 3%. Now it's going up. So that you got two things going. Actually, you got three things. Because we dumbed down the Treasury bills in order to save money on interest. We took the long-term Treasury bills and made them short-term. Which means now that we roll over the debt, we're going to be subject immediately to the higher interest rates. So you got three things pushing the dollar from 263 to 915, and all of a sudden it's 13 percent. Now where's that 13 percent coming from? And go look at the honor. It's going down from 30 to 23 percent. That's defense, homeland security, education, your standard of living. When is America going to wake up? When are these politicians going to decide we've got to do something right for the next generation? But they're not worried about that. They're worried about their election and their pension. And this is the problem we have. Conflict of interest. We're currying favor with today's voters. Remember that little chart I had before? Currying favor with today's voters at the expense of tomorrow's taxpayers. That's you. That's the ultimate conflict. That's the immorality ISIS to have. Now, look at this chart. Here's your actual 263. See it at the top? That's the actual interest. What is the tax side of it? Well, if you saw the chart, it's 590 billion. 263 to 590. Look what happens in 10 years. These are not my numbers. Look what happens to interest. 950 short, right? Before the chart before? 915. 
But look what you did to that segment. Only goes up to 769. So interest is now squeezing out the Fed. Where's the money coming from? You know, we gotta borrow it. Now you gotta borrow to pay the interest besides. Am I the only genius in town that's telling you this? I mean, I don't understand why we're not more excited about this. That sense of justice and, and morality. And that's what we okay. okay. This shot is so brief. Look at this. We cut it off a little bit. They rank 34 countries in the world. Fiscal responsibility. Three many. Fiscal space, fiscal path, fiscal governance. Greatest country in the world, the United States. Look what we rank. Now, I, I didn't update this, but it's worse today. We're ranked number 28. Just before Bank of Portugal and Greece. Hey, these are the numbers that I can come up with. That's but basically, the CFO Act was my way of solving this problem. To get the accounting system to change, they did pass it, but to pass it, they dumbed it down. They took out, number one, the accrual account. They left the old accounting system there. But things happened along the way to at least start, uh, it's on another chart here, they're at least starting to advertise the fact there are other numbers that are not on the books that we've got to be worried about for sustainability. I'll show you that chart on this. Why are poor accounting is weak? This is what my old accounting firm said. At its core, the cash basis system of accounting, which is what we use, a system which records financial transactions when income is received, expenses are paid. But in, in real life, nothing happens that instantaneously. You get a bill. Now, if I get a bill, is that an expense? Yes. In accounting, that's an expense. I got to put it on the books. It's expense, double accounting, expense, and it's a liability, all right? Government is not doing that enough, so we don't know what's coming down the pipe. And here's the conflict I said before, current inflation, 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 expense of tomorrow's tax pay. Right? Okay, bottom line. I think, in your case, I have to define it as citizenship. What is it that we want as good citizens? When you become parents, and Saul talks about society. Thomas Paine said it well. Read his crisis papers in the common sense. And you'll see how he defined society versus government. You know what he said about government? It's there to protect us against other people. It's there to protect, you know, it's, it's something that monitors the vices of people. But he said society is a patron. Society is good. It's government that can be bad. And what he said was that we need to be good citizens. And what I'm saying here is, if I'm a good father, what am I looking for? I'm looking to give my children a head start in life, help them paying off the national debt, sometimes to maybe move them into our houses if they need it. We don't add more debt to them. So you got to look at government. To be a good citizen and, 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 and to say the government's good, we got to think about it in those terms. Why should government be putting a burden on the future of America? You, because you're not speaking loud enough. First of all, many of you can't vote. Second of all, you don't know how to speak loud yet. I'm giving you 60 years worth of experience, me, right, running around. So don't worry that you haven't done it yet. But I'm just trying to put a seat in your mind that maybe public service will be good. And one day, you, you, you would want to become a sculpture on that. Now, thank you pretty much. And there it is. Now, look at that. That's how it book. I, my logo, I took a congressman's voting card, same size as a credit card, and I called it, in this book, you'll see it, chapter one, the most expensive credit card in the world. It's a congressman's voting card. There's a computer at the end of a row of seats, you put it in, same size as a credit card, what are you doing? You're raising the national debt. The money's not there. So it is the most expensive credit card in the world. And basically, that's what that says. And what does this credit card say? Represent credit line unlimited, payment date never, bill to future generations. That's you. Thank you. Thank you.